This is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 28th of January. And here is my software defined and fully virtualized co host, Yon. Hello, Yon. Crashing in three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't need to hear about your core dump. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that went. Yeah, <laughs> it was fast, that whatever it was. Ex- that went exactly <laughs> as you expected, let's face it. True anyway, enough. Anyway, how are enough. you, sir? I'm fine, I'm fine, but uh, that is all important because uh, we're joined by a guest today. We are. We're joined by a uh, friend, ex-colleague, and uh, all-around good egg, uh, Nicholas, who... Uh, is now at Fortinet, and he's uh, very much an NFV pioneer. He was involved in the very early stages of uh, network function virtualization. But uh, rather than have me prattle on about it, let's uh, let's switch across to Nicholas, and he can tell us all about NFV and SDA. So we're joined here today by uh, Nicholas Thomas. Welcome to the podcast, Nicholas. Thank you, Dave. Hi, I'm Nicholas. Very, very happy to be with you, Dave. So uh, we've we've worked together in in previous lives, but you're you're now at at Fortinet, and you uh, you've been involved in this these mysterious technologies um, known as SDN and NFV. So. First of all, tell us tell us a bit about you. How did you find yourself into this uh, mysterious and wonderful world? <laughs> like like many of of the very advanced uh, changes uh, by accident. Um, <laughs> I, my background is is in deep core telco and platforms for two decades mm-hmm. now. I'm getting older, uh, and I happen to be working. I was at HP at the time, uh, but working uh, with a bunch of um, tier one telcos, uh, especially uh, BT, to try new things and try crazy things. It was in 2011, uh, trying to do network functions in a VM and, yeah. and, and, and really trying to do that. And this is what network function virtualization is about. Um, and I was in charge of two out of the six POCs that have been used to create the NFV movement that started from the public in 2012, um, Mm -hmm. where uh, we were using uh, VMs to run what was run before on dedicated hardware, sometimes ASICs, um, but mostly in, in closed appliance model move to mm-hmm. VMs instead. Um, the, the main driver is uh, it w- was very simple. Uh, at the time, if you had to connect a branch to anything and you want a firewall, a CDN, a connectivity, you will, have, you will need five boxes, basically. Uh, and sending five boxes to the other side of the planet, going through customs, setting all that up with manuals, it's enormously costly <laughs> and mm-hmm. error prone. Uh, many humans from different companies, nightmare. Um, this, this is all, 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 all that started. Um, and something came uh, a bit by accident was, was the cloud uh, and, and getting mm-hmm. the old things. Uh, and then the two things collide and exploded. And this is where you have all those uh, all those terms, etc., uh, in the telco and and the change in the telco realm, and of course, uh, as anything in telco, uh, we love to have a standard definition, very precise, defined standard by a standard body. Uh, I'm part yeah. of those things. I'm actually uh, at the moment defining a new spec, uh, but we end up. Unfortunately, we have to end up, <laughs> I, we don't know any other better way, uh, with three or four letters acronyms for everything. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it, it, it is sometimes very frightening for people. Um, I may try to translate in normal language if I can. <laughs> so uh, starting off then with... 
um, you know, you first started talking about more of the NFV side of things. Um, how you know how does um, how does S, uh, software defined networking differ from network function virt- virtualization? Um, SDN initially was really um, and and we go back to precise definitions and uh, the, the, and mm-hmm. the, and the interest of having a precise definition. Otherwise, everyone interpret their own way and, and no, people feel they talk about a thing but they don't. Um, and it's it's the source of many conflicts. Um, SDN for the telco realm initially was really uh, overlay networks, basically. Right. Um, the VX lines, uh, manage uh, VPNs on top of BGPs and things like that. So really having uh, a way to have an, what we most people know as an overlay network. Uh, if your audience, people in your audience, not deeply into telc and telco, it's basically what you get if you ask any public cloud a network. You have your own network, your own IPs, uh, and the underlying net real gears and boxes and cables uh, can change and move, but you don't see the difference. That's that's basically what it is. Um, some some may argue that anything programmable as a network is an SDN, but then you go too far. Uh, yeah. And NFV is really putting a network function in a VM. A network function uh, is is anything on the network uh, that 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 helps uh, connect or go somewhere. So uh, if you're if you use a mobile phone, there is a network functions that knows who you are and where you are. Because if you don't know where you are on a mobile network, we can't send you packets. And so that's very, very important. Uh, just just trying to, to give you a very simple example of that. Um, many people know CDNs. Uh, CDNs are usually uh, seen as network functions. So accelerations and getting content closer to you, basically. So yeah. the relationship should be quite quite easy to understand they 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 really interact together like you usually use both yeah yeah so how has this how has this changed the or how is this changing the industry from a, a an industry that was as you said earlier very focused around you know shipping proprietary kind of boxes um, that you know may have had very expensive hardware or incredibly cheap hardware. You know there was there was no way to tell. There was just like the specs on the outside, and you paid an extortionate amount of money, and you got a piece of hardware, and then it needed configuring and all those kind of things. How you know how has this kind of um, this NFV and SDN revolution kind of changed the industry enormously? Um, and that, that was the initial goal. Uh, the initial goal was really to have um, the, the main, mainly the T1 service providers, so the AT&T, mm-hmm. Orange, BT, Telefonica of the world, sorry, Vodafone, sorry for the one I didn't name. Uh, <laughs> um, they have huge networks, and they, they saw uh, from the cloud perspective that getting involved more deeply into what they have instead of only relying on the network equipment providers, so the Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei of the world, uh, to do uh, and and just resell the technology. It's not. It's, it's more. It's more complex than that. Uh, but because they usually, the the previous model was really to have the service providers going to standards, send doing specs, so they have interoperable things. And then the equipment providers build on on that spec and roadmaps. It takes years, and then it takes another ten years to do actual interrupt cha- uh, challenging. And they were like the number of NEPs reduced. They see all the benefits of having programmable things from the, the mainly the public cloud people. Remember mm-hmm. that those boxes go 
come with a 600 page manual and CLI commits. <laughs> Which nobody reads, right? Uh, nobody certified <laughs> needs to read because <laughs> <laughs> and, and played with because it's, 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 it's very complex. And uh, if you do one little mistake, the mm. whole internet is down. Yeah. That that that's how, how dramatic it can come. Uh, so it's 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 very frightening, and um, you know people frightened uh, fear change. Mm -hmm. All those technology are here to embrace change. So the the the, the change is phenomenal. Um, if, even though some of this um, tier one and those service providers. Being able to have a model with a platform where in which they can plug in VMs and then uh, rely on programs instead of people, uh, they realize that integration is not easy. <laughs> and what was perceived as an enormous uh, cost or sometimes even more than, uh, than that, was actually delivering some value uh, in in a in a very industrial way. Uh, mm. the, you you have to remember you have constraints. Um, the equipment of service provider are spreaded all over the country. Literally, that's that's all you get a network. Yeah, uh, you can't send someone to every little point on every little city. If something was wrong and you need a fix, that doesn't work. You can do that in a data center. You can't do that. You you can't afford it in a, in, a, yeah. in a fully distributed network, meaning that you have to rely on those things to work all the time, um, and it's even mandatory in many cases for for nine on one for um, uh, emergency calls. You want mm -hmm. your emergency calls to go through. So they have very, very strong constraints uh, on those things, on the distribution, on the reliability, et cetera, et cetera. The, the way it has been traditionally solved was to have something very well known, tested to the, to the bones, and, and then spread it and put in the, in, in the wild. But it takes five years to reach that point. So your code is 10 years old, basically. Yeah. Um, super reliable, but you can't change anything because it's, it's, way, it's way too damageable. Uh, even even I, I, there, is, there is a couple of uh, pictures I love uh, and I use in, in many cases uh, from Facebook. Uh, the, the famous phrase, uh, go fast and break things. Mm -hmm. um, you can check that mm -hmm. one and then try to find the same the, the same picture but from the, the, the following year event and the following year was yeah, go fast break things on stable infra <laughs> yes, stable infra <laughs> is important and, and this is what those service providers provide uh, so yes can look slow, whatever, but still, it's important and it's important. It's reliable. Uh, so, otherwise, none of the benefits of of the cloud, cloud native, uh, comes true because you can't deploy on anything. I mean, it's it seems like a, a massive shift, a massive change for an industry that you know has been one of one of, if not one of the slowest industries to adopt kind of new technologies. All of a sudden, you know, we're now talking about cloud native and Kubernetes and, and all of this, you know, technology running in the cloud. How, how has this, you know, one of the things you mentioned, for example, was like the, the NEPs, the network equipment providers. Um, you know, how have the, the sort of, I wouldn't necessarily say legacy, but the, um, traditional ne uh, network equipment providers adapted, and you know, have we seen lots of smaller, more I don't know, agile or nimble kind of um, any uh, NEPs kind of start up 
that you know are more aligned to this vision you know from the start from the beginning i it, it's a bit of two questions here uh, but globally the industry is uh Lurking and and they want to have the operational efficiency of of that the cloud native and the cloud provide. They they yeah. they don't only want it; they see it as as a make or die mm-hmm. uh, type of things. That literally, uh, and and that's why you see some more uh, service providers. Uh, involved in the uh, clone and there there is a new uh, group at the clonative foundation uh, for telcos uh, dedicated to telcos okay. um, mm-hmm. and everything uh, that is going to be 5g is uh, that everyone tries to do uh, on containers uh, the functions at least the functions themselves uh, container based and everything around the edge is going to is moving to container based more than that the control part of the networks is moving to http uh, ssl uh, json type of uh, control and and commands uh, which has never been the case before mm-hmm. uh, we always use it it's critical it, it if if you can get a hands on this you are, you have the full control of the full network so it it was always uh, dedicated specific protocols um, and uh, the industry is moving to a more standard one i mean moving it goes at the speed of uh, being able to <laughs> roll out antennas cables etc it's it's an enormous amount of money uh, it's it's a gigantic depth uh, yeah. People don't realize how, how expensive it is. Um, usually, when when you uh, just just look at take one example of fiber, uh, <coughs> I have to convert in years. Uh, but fiber is 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 very cheap. Uh, a meter of fiber is probably a few cent, but the hole in the ground to put it is probably a thousand <laughs> euros. <laughs> For a meter, so yep. that it and <clears throat> because of 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 all that is it's extremely uh, hard. Uh, you have regulation in different countries, yada yada. So if, even Google tried to do their their own fiber networks, etc. Mm-hmm. And 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 it's not that they realize it's not that easy. So this this industry has real challenge to be solved uh, from a technical point of view also. Because uh, simply adopting someone else's tools, uh, as I love to say, uh, a carpenter will very wisely choose their hammer, but using the same hammer mm-hmm. don't make you a carpenter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's you, you sometimes have to deal with those things, and um, the, the the Kubernetes Docker's provides a lot of benefits in many cases. But the split on the network, the massive, we, we, we're, talking, uh, we're talking terabytes per second type of networking issues. Yeah. Um, load balancing that is a challenge by itself um, and usually done by, by dedicated ASICs. Uh, even even the, the largest public clouds uh, also use that approach. But the good thing and, and the change is even if you do ASICs, and, and we do in, in my own company, um, we have APIs to drive this. Or you can also do with VMs, but it's all API to even now. Even though, even though you don't necessarily use an hypervisor, a container, whatnot, underneath, because those have... Uh, no, it's, it's interesting when you move to security, which is was not my initial... Uh, step in the industry is it, it really reveals uh, a lot of the things you put under the carpet during the deployment and the developments. <laughs> yeah. And uh, because you, you, you cannot do security only at the spec level. Uh, it's, it's a mix of theory checks and, 
um, the actual config. You, you, you can use our firewall that are used by Department of Defense and Banks, but if you put admin mm -hmm. admin on the internet, <laughs> you're just yeah, as exactly. good as nothing. Uh, so yeah. it, 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 everything needs to be aligned in the right directions to be actually secure. Here. And, and that is uh, very demanding, but it reveals a lot of issues, a, lo a lo lot of problems in, in many cases, and, and shortcuts that has been done. Or wishful thinking sometimes. Mm. Uh, people assume that things will uh, move in the right direction for them by accident sometimes. And hackers, your enemies in, in security, they love your assumptions. Because that's the area where you're not looking. That's the dark of your uh, mindset where they can thrive. So, I think we did aggressive it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's all it's all good. It's all good discussion. So if you've got you've got a situation now where we're moving from, you know, again, traditional appliances through to virtual instances running essentially running these these core networks you've obviously got um you know significant improvements in terms of you know flexibility at the at the press of a button you've got you know the ease of updating these things compared to you know a, a fixed appliance that you know you just as you said earlier you can't you know, ship all boxes around every time something needs to be updated. It's just not feasible. Whereas, you know, it's one of the one of the magical things about software is an update is just a you know a click or a command away. But what what other problems are um, technologies like uh, NFV and SDN solving? What are, what are some of the other areas that maybe we haven't touched on yet? So be, before answering, just to complement on on. on, on what you just said, uh, it's also act, actually done right, a, a very good thing for security. Um, mm -hmm. Because everything is, if, if, you had, if it's code that is deploying things, it's much easier to audit it. It's much mm -hmm. easier to understand what was going wrong, and you know that it was actually what was deployed compared to a human with a 200 page manual. Yeah. Those do mistakes in double digit percentage. It's, it's, it's a lot. And, and solving problem at the scale of an at &T, for example, can be a nightmare. Um, the other, so to, to, to di more directly answer your question, uh, the other, um, problem or opportunity that it provides um, is really the capability to move uh, workloads, uh, compute closer to the edge. Um, and, and why is that important? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you may just think of the service providers, they want to grasp to try to grasp some of that from the cloud back into their own networks. Uh, it, no, it's important for, for latency um, because if you have to go back and forth uh, from um, France to California every single time for every single problem, first of all, it doesn't look like to be that much uh, efficient and, and it takes time. Yeah, just law of physics of having the the packets and the photons moving from there to there, um, and this is one of the things five G uh, tries to address and tackle is having a millisecond uh, latency, um, and you can't you, just the law of physics uh, you can't achieve it if you have to go back and forth the planet uh, to to deliver the service. So you have to have those services running closer to the users or between the user and the service they want to use. Um, so, so that's, that's really one of the key area where, uh, it can come to, um, then, then we can uh, start to talk about slices, but that's uh, a very, 
blurry concept, uh, especially for people not used to deal with uh, telco networks. So, for for all of these for all of these significant benefits, I mean, we have talked about there's there's some fairly um, fairly impactful costs to actually roll this out. Um, which you know, which is obviously a a concern that, um, and it's a fairly significant kind of shift in mindset, which are both concerns that obviously the providers must be facing. But what are the other? I mean, problems is probably the wrong word. But what are the other concerns that organisations looking at software defined networking, network function virtualization? Um, uh, you know, are seeing that may, you know, maybe were expected or maybe were slightly surprising. We we reach and and you probably heard a lot about that. Uh, probably the delusion phase, uh, as as any new new things, uh, people m- make a lot of expectations, uh, but there is it's there is a big big gap between what the technology may actually do or can do in theory and actually doing it. And yeah. And and then when you try you realize it's not working that that well. Um your ecosystem did not follow you as you expected, uh etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and this is probably one of the main challenge and why you hear People think, oh, NFV fails us, let's move to cloud native directly, etc. They just forget that cloud native, meaning Docker Kubernetes, runs on something, mm-hmm. which is an infra. And for example, Kubernetes deploys something pretty useful to it called nodes, and nodes are VMs, <laughs> full stop. Uh, yes, there is, there is some projects, but globally, they are VMs. Uh, so the, you you... You actually stack up things you don't replace, and and if you if you if you try to jump to the next step without having a solid foundation of on the first one, you end up with a very uh, complex castle of cards uh, that is not the solidity you expected in the first place. Well. There we go. There is part one of our session on NFV and SDN. Hope you found that useful and interesting. The second half, we'll go into a little bit more of the what, why, and how, and uh, yeah, more interesting stuff to come. Yep, cool stuff. Thanks a lot, Nicholas, for spending time with us. And uh, as you said, next, uh, not next, because next episode is going to be a news episode, but after that, 179, we'll have the uh, finalization. Yes, I discovered that word today of this <laughs> interview. Anything else from you? That's it from me. Then that's all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast. You can become a Patreon. Every contribution helps, and we are very grateful to our Patreons. If you are on YouTube, you can like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Make Dave happy. You can go to www.roaringelephant.org and find the link there for our Patreon page and a lot more information about the podcast and past episodes. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter using the Loopcast tag. And you can send feedback to their email box at podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then.